Thank you. What can this bucket and conservation have in common? Trinidad is an island in the Caribbean, and it's a hotbed for a sea turtle called a leatherback. It's a hotbed for their nesting. Leatherback sea turtles, if you don't know, are some of the largest reptiles in the world. They can grow to be a ton. Their shells can be more than two and a half meters in length. They can dive down 1,200 meters or more. You know what their diet is? Jellyfish. So, the female turtles come on the beach on the northern coast of Trinidad, and they'll lay 80 to 100 eggs. 60, 75 days later, these eggs hatch, and the babies go down to the beach into the sea to face a life of danger. Not a lot of these baby sea turtles are meant to survive. Way less than 1%. Besides these natural predators, in some areas there are what we call unnatural predators. Like some of these sea turtle nests hatch near villages where there's domestic animals. Pigs and dogs with their good sense of sight, good sense of smell, will find these nests hatching and they'll gobble as many as they can. Next in line are chickens, cats. They'll take a big number themselves. If the turtles are lucky enough to get down to the beach, the black vultures pick them off before they reach the sea. Enter my heroes. Some children, about 10 to 13, 14 years old. And what they do before they go to school is they take these buckets and they walk along the beach and they collect hatchling turtles. They put these buckets in a secure area, lock them up, and go off to school. When they return from school, hopefully they do their homework, they'll open up this area and allow visitors to come in and view the turtles, take photos of them, all for a nominal fee. At dusk, they'll take these buckets down to as close to where the nests hatched as possible. And they'll let the turtles go. You have to actually let the turtles go from the nest they were hatched. Because biologists say, and they, biologists never agree, but this time they do. <laughs> they agree that these turtles need to go to the sea from the beach they were hatched from. In such a fashion, when they grow up and mature, the females will, will return to the same beach. It's amazing. So why is this important to me? I'm a conservation biologist. Been doing this work for over 40 years. I work with animals that people don't like. I work with lizards, dragons, venomous snakes, crocodiles, as you'll see later. For me, after all of this time, what I found out is simplicity, like, just like this bucket, is sometimes the best conservation tool. You don't have to look any further than the basic needs of people. I also work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Actually, I work so far out in the forest that if I went any further, I'd be coming out. I've been there for eight years. We employ about 40 Congolese people, and our job is to monitor forests. Our job is to actually save equatorial African rainforests. Our Congolese workers do forest surveys, measure plots, biodiversity surveys, measure wildlife, whatever's left. Agroforestry programs. We teach the locals better agricultural techniques. In Congo, like many parts of Africa, people really like to eat, seasonally, caterpillars. They go out collecting these caterpillars, and they're from a moth called the Saturn moth. And what she does, the female, she lays her eggs on the bottom of leaves, 
trees, bushes, and many times they only choose one type of plant. It's called a host plant. So these tiny caterpillars hatch from the egg and they begin feeding on this host plant. Before long, they're about 10 centimeters in length, ready to harvest. People go out into the forest, sometimes many kilometers away, to collect these caterpillars. Often, they send children out. The kids are a lot more nimble than you or I. They can get up and down those trees. So one time we were out in the Congo. I was out there with the boss, Don, talking with our guys. And he says, you guys know what the host tree are for these caterpillars. They really like them. They say, of course we do. So, so the boss said, let's take a couple days. Let's go and collect seeds and saplings from these trees. Let's bring them to our nursery. Let's grow them up a little bit and plant them around. Simple enough, right? We planted them when they're about, oh, three quarters of a meter high. Planted them around our compound, around people's homes, fallow farmland. Okay, fast forward. Four, five years later, you're in equatorial Africa. These trees are three meters or more in, in height. A couple Septembers ago, I got a call from one of my managers, Philemon. He says, Joe, guess what? We've got caterpillars, plenty of them. What happened was, for the few years these trees were going, growing, nobody paid attention to them. When the trees began to grow up and mature, the moths found them, they laid their eggs, and our guys found caterpillars. Boy, were they happy. Word got around, and I don't know if you folks have ever heard, of the coconut telegraph? No internet, no electricity, but believe me, these villages from far and wide heard about this. They came to ask our guys. It's, it's simple. You collect the trees. In fact, some of them put the seeds in our nursery, and they planted them, and here you have it. Simple. They made a plan, and the plan worked. Now. Three things, a win-win-win situation. People have a food source close to home. They're growing native trees. Now they're actually reforesting the forest. And there's plenty of caterpillars. Win-win-win. So, I know you're thinking, how do you eat them? They can be broiled. They can be baked. You could cook them any way you cook any meat or fish. Personally, I like them fried. <laughs> Trinidad and Congo were planned activities. Sometimes simple conservation is unintentional. Another project I work on is in Florida. And in the 1960s, 70s, early 70s, the population in Florida was booming. They needed more power, more electricity. So a company, a local company, Florida Power and Light, built two nuclear reactors right on Biscayne Bay to supply power. And in order to cool these reactors, engineers got together and they devised this cooling canal system. It's about eight kilometers long, three and a half kilometers wide. It's 32 canals and berms, end to end. In fact, if you put them in one line, they'd be over 260 kilometers long. At the same time lived in the area a very rare animal, the American crocodile. Now, the American crocodile is found in the Caribbean and parts of the Caribbean, Mexico, both coasts, Central and South America. The northernmost extent of their range is South Florida. Why 
at, at this time, they were, they were extremely rare. There was no more than 150 to 300 non-hatchlings in South Florida. The reasons why they're so rare is they're very particular about their habitat and their natural history. They're estuarine animals. They live along the coast in mangroves, salt water. Yet, when they hatch from the egg, they have no salt excreting glands. They're particular, so particular, but in a short time, this cooling canal system came out there with all the ingredients for their natural history. There's food, plenty of food available. There's high berms, anywhere from one to three meters high. Substrate for nesting, which also limits their range. And when they nest, they nest because it's so high, they drain. On those berms, besides the nice substrate, are freshwater ponds, which was really lacking, probably one of the main reasons they were so rare. So now, the crocs can hatch from their egg, they can go in the fresh water, and naturally have their glands develop and then go out in the wild. That was in about 1989, I began working at this place. And over that time, I have uncovered or observed over 400 nests, successful nests. I have personally marked and released 6,000 hatchlings. In 2007, American crocodiles were downlisted by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service from an endangered to a threatened species, partly because of this. This proves one thing to me, that industry can coexist with the environment. You see, as I said, Simple works. Like, for instance, everything I need, most everything I need for conservation fits in this little pack I have. Even in Congo, I carry a flashlight to look for those snakes at night in the forest and to shine the crocodile's eyes. And out in the forest, there's no batteries either. You better carry some batteries. Another great tool of mine happens to be a compass. You don't need any batteries for this. And not only can you get into the forest with this, you can also get out. <laughs> Last but not least, you have to make your observations in a field notebook. With my mind, I can't remember a lot of things, so you use this. So, what I'm trying to tell you here today is that simple can go a long way for being successful, and successful for everyone involved in conservation. What would be your tool? Thank you. <laughs>